Good morning. Let me try that again. Good morning. There we go. <laughs> and welcome to South Columbia Baptist Church. We're very glad that you're here, that you've joined us for worship this morning. If you're joining us online, uh, welcome as well. well. I wish you were here, but we're glad that you joined us. I'm Pastor Steve, and let me tell you just a little bit about our church. Our mission of our church is to introduce people to Jesus and to help those who know him to become like him. And we're trying to carry out that mission through uh, worship and nurture and outreach. And I am glad you're here this morning, and uh, we're going to be worshiping together and taking a look at the Lord's Prayer today in the context of, the, of our scripture. We do not have a regularly scheduled time of giving during the worship service, but if you would like to give and help support the ministry, you can do so by putting uh, something in the box out there on the table in the front, or if you go to our church webpage, there uh, is a way that you can give online. And again, I just want to say thank you for your support to the ministry of our church. We, we really do appreciate it. Um, let's see. I don't think that I have any announcements that I know of. Um, so is there anything I forgot? Well, I'll... Huh? I'm going to do that later. So my, my wife is reminding me, and I appreciate that. So anyway, why don't we take a moment to stand and say hello, and, and you tell, greet someone around you and tell them you're glad they're here. All right, let's sing together, starting with Build Your Kingdom Here. Sing with us.
pray together. Father, we do thank you for your great love and for the promise of your coming kingdom. Lord, we do pray that your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We thank you for bringing us together this morning. We thank you for the opportunity to come and to worship. And we pray that your Holy Spirit will fill us and enable us, Lord, to be uh, to worship in spirit and truth. We pray that you would make us aware of your presence in our lives. And Father, I want to thank you for everyone who has joined today where we might come. Uh, Lord, open our heart and open our eyes that we might see Jesus in whose name we pray. Amen. Let's sing some more together. Open our eyes, Lord.
Today's scripture reading comes from our Lord's Sermon on the Mount. And seeing the multitude, he went up to the mountain. And, and when he was set, his disciples came unto him. And he said, After this manner, therefore, pray you, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Let's pray together. Father, you are a holy God, separate apart from all your creation, above it and beyond it, and we praise you for deigning to give us a Savior so that you could see us through his holiness and see us through the, the, the shed blood of your Son, and we, we praise you for that. Father, we want your, your kingdom to be done, your, your, your will to be done here on earth. And yes, though, though it's sometimes very hard to take, we want that will done as you would have it done in your heaven as well. We thank you for the meals that you gave each of us and, and, the, and the wonderful provision that you make for all of us. You are such a good and gracious host. You are such a good and gracious provider, and we thank you for that. And Father, we ask that you forgive our, our unbelief. We live in an age where unbelief is poured out, just, just poured out like, like water. And we thank you that you've given us your word of God that we can turn to and hold on to in that flood of, of evil that pours out every day from the spigots of the world around us. And we thank you that you don't lead us into temptation, but as David said, you lead us by the still waters. And we thank you for that as well. And Father, we would forgive all of those that have that have done evil to us and have trespassed against us. We, we, it's so hard, Father, but we, 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 we ask that you help us forgive them when they do things that we don't understand and they do things that are evil to us. And Father, we pray I pray for this congregation, Lord. Bless them and keep them and prosper them. We pray these things in the holy name of your Son, Jesus. Amen. Now let's stand. We're actually going to sing the Lord's Prayer together right now.
This morning is the last day that we were to bring in our Operation Christmas Child shoe boxes. And I don't know if you're like me over the last several years, we've filled some and brought them back to the church and had kind of a basic idea that they were going somewhere to a child. But Operation Christmas Child is an outreach ministry of Samaritan's Purse that delivers the great joy and good news of Jesus Christ to children in need around the world, especially those affected by war, poverty, uh, natural disaster, famine, and disease through these uh, gift-filled shoe boxes. And so these boxes are full of quality toys, school supplies, personal care items as an ex tangible expression of God's immense love for that child. And for some, it's the first gift they've ever received. And so delivered by local church partners, shoebox gifts provide an opportunity to present the gospel to boys and girls in a clear, child-friendly way. Now, when the shoeboxes leave our church, then they're taken to local distribution centers where thousands of volunteers serve annually inspecting and preparing these for international shipping. Every hour, work stops for a few minutes to pray for the children who will receive the boxes. But long before these boxes arrive to the 100 countries they go to, volunteer national leadership teams train pastors and community leaders who want to share the message of the gospel with children. And local ministry partners distribute the gifts to the children in their communities. And so after receiving these gifts, these shoe boxes, many of the boys and girls are invited to enroll in the greatest journey, which is a 12-lesson discipleship program. And through the program, churches and ministry partners are able to establish long-term caring relationships with children and families sharing the love of Jesus Christ. Now, Operation Christmas Child encourages us to pray for the child who will receive the shoe box. I just have one box, but if, I, my, if my count is anywhere near accurate, uh, out in the, the uh, business center, uh, partnered with our church and our Awana ministry this year, we have about 180 shoe boxes that we're going to be sending. And so each one of those uh, is a potential uh, witness to a child. And so this morning, I thought before Pastor Jim and I get into the message that we take a moment and we would pray over the shoe boxes. And Operation Christmas Child asks us to pray for three things, for the family to be receptive to the good news of the gospel, for the pastor of the church who's going to be delivering this gift and for their community to be transformed by the gospel. So I want to thank all of you who have brought in a shoebox. And uh, someone asked, do these, do these go all over the world? Yes, literally to 100 different countries. And by the way, there is a way that you can track your box uh, and see where it ends up if you're interested in doing that. I would suggest you go to SamaritansPurse.org and, and check that out online. But um, let's pray together over the boxes. Father, this one box represents the rest that our church has collected along with our uh, Awana families. And we want to offer them to you today as just a small sacrifice on our part with the hope, Lord, that, uh, that these boxes will be used in the lives of children that would ultimately result in them coming to know Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. Father, we pray for the families of the children who receive the box, that if they don't know you, that they would be open to hear the gospel message. And we pray, Lord, that the Holy Spirit even now might be preparing that way for us. We also pray, Lord, for the local pastors who will be distributing these boxes and for the local churches that you would open up doors of opportunity for ministry and service, not only to the children, but to their families and, and Lord, to the entire community. And so we pray that the impact would, would go even into the community and that, Lord, the, literally the lives of people would be transformed. Father, I thank you for making it possible for us to have the personal resources by which we can fill a box. And so, Lord, again, we want to dedicate what we've done this year to you uh, as Lord others will do the same and we ask for your blessing and for your grace in Jesus name amen
So I mentioned last week that we're beginning a series, uh, we began a series on prayer, and today Pastor Jim and I are going to share that responsibility. Okay, good morning everyone. Uh, before, uh, before I begin, uh, I just want to say thank you uh, to uh, South Columbia. You guys have reached out uh, to us, in case you didn't know, uh, my wife Elizabeth, her mom passed away, and uh, the outpouring of love uh, has been phenomenal. And so we just want to, uh, on behalf of Elizabeth and our family, I just want to thank you guys very much. Um, I also would recommend if you go through anything like this to uh, get on the meal train. Uh, it was, a, it was a, a great blessing to our family. Uh, it really touched us. Um, and it also touched our taste buds. The food was phenomenal. And so, um, so please take advantage of that. It's, uh, it really does bless you. So uh, last week we started a new sermon series on prayer. Uh, the message that Pastor Steve delivered was that prayer begins with an understanding that it's a fellowship with God in which we exercise our faith in him and where we experience a relationship with him. In other words, when we pray, we trust that God really does exist, that he rewards those who seek him, that he is a good God, a gracious God, a generous God, and that we can know him. And this is most evident in that when we pray, we experience a relationship with him, which is part of God's original design, that we would have fellowship with him. Prayer is an essential element by which we relate to God. And as we read the gospel accounts of Jesus' life, we see that prayer played a significant part in it. Jesus would go out early in the morning to pray, when it was quiet and where he could be alone with the Father. Sometimes he would pray all night, like before he would choose the twelve. In John chapter 17, we find the longest recorded prayer of Jesus, where he prays for his disciples and all those who would come after him. Even on the cross, Jesus turns to the Father in prayer. And so Jesus models for us a life of prayer. But Jesus also taught about prayer. And without a doubt, his most popular teaching on prayer comes from Matthew chapter 6, starting in verse 5. Here he starts off by teaching us how to pray. And when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners, that they may be seen by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your father who is in secret, and your father who sees in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. Do not be like them, for our Father knows that, uh, for our Father knows what you need before you ask him. The first thing for us to notice is the phrase, and when you pray. In verse 5 and verse 7, Jesus doesn't command us to pray. He doesn't lord it over us, though if anyone could, it, it would be our Lord, right, telling us that we would need to pray. No, the assumption is that we are praying and that we will continue to pray. The second thing we should take note from this passage is that we shouldn't pray like the hypocrites. The Greek word for hypocrite means play actor. It means someone who puts on a mask and plays a role, a part. Someone who pretends to be something he's not. Hypocrites speak one set of beliefs, but live by a different set of beliefs. In his book on the Lord's Prayer, Reverend Kevin DeYoung points out that we can clearly see what Jesus has in mind from Matthew 6.1. Beware of practicing your righteousness, righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them. That's what hypocrites do. They don't really love God. They don't really love the kingdom. They don't really love the hallowing of God's name. They love to pray in the synagogues and at the street corners, and they love to be seen by others. But the goal of prayer is not to be seen by others, but it's to be seen by God. He is our audience and the only audience we should seek in prayer. The third insight we should take from this passage is that we shouldn't pray like the pagans, who mindlessly repeated the names of their gods uh, or the same words over and over again in their prayers, thinking that this is how they'll be heard. The word in Matthew 6-7 for empty phrases has the idea of to keep on babbling. God doesn't keep a word count. He doesn't merit favor uh, we don't merit favor from God based on how long our prayers are. 
And this is where Jesus moves on from how we should pray to what we should pray. Read with me, starting in verse 9. Pray then like this, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Now this is a prayer that many of us have memorized. It's a prayer that many of us have prayed many a time, which is great. By all means, please continue to do so. My only word of caution is that when we pray the same prayer over and over and over again, even though it could be the Lord's Prayer, it could become overly familiar to us. And so when we utter these words, they've become rote, meaningless, mindless, uh, mindless repetition, uh, repetition, empty phrases, babbling. And we run the risk of praying like the, uh, like the pagans. We don't want to just run through the motions when we pray the Lord's Prayer. What I find interesting uh, in the first part of verse 9 is what Jesus doesn't tell us. He doesn't tell us to pray these exact words. Instead, he tells us to pray like this. And so while there's nothing wrong with praying this, uh, this prayer verbatim, uh, as we find it in Scripture, an argument could be made that this is a model of prayer that Jesus teaches us to follow. Either way, by delving into the meaning of the text, it should benefit both uh, those of us who are word-for-word Lord's Prayer prayers uh, and those of us who prefer to follow the structure of the prayer, uh, but with our own words. The prayer consists of petitions brought before God, which can be divided into two sections. The first section focuses on God and his glory. This is found in verses 9 and 10. The second section is about our good and focuses on our needs. And this is found in verses 11 through 13. I'll be focusing on the first section, and then I'll tag Pastor Steve, and he'll come up and preach on the second section. Before we get into the petitions, we should recognize how amazing the opening line of the prayer is, just the opening line itself. Now, in our Bibles, the prayer begins with the word our. But in the Greek, the first word of the prayer is Father. This is worth considering for a moment. Jesus wants us to call the eternal God, the God who created the heavens and the earth, Father. God is not a distant deity who keeps his creation at arm's length. He didn't just wind up the universe just to let it go and watch from afar. He's not cold. He's not aloof. To call God Father is to say that he's loving, caring, close, warm, involved, and that we have an intimate and secure relationship with him. I want to be sensitive to those of us who don't have the fondest memories of or the closest of relationships with our earthly fathers. Here I found the words of Pastor DeYoung to be helpful and instructive. The fatherhood of God is challenging for some. Some Christians grew up with a lame father, an abusive father, or no father at all. We can sympathize with those for whom the word father stirs up all sorts of bad connotations. But our Father in heaven is what earthly fathers should be like. We must interpret our experiences through God's revelation and not the other way around. Something to consider also is that being a child of God and thus rightfully uh, calling God Father is not a right that everyone has, but it's a spiritual privilege given to those who believe. John tells us that to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, who gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. He also writes, see what kind of love the Father has given to us, that we should be called children of God. Notice also that it's not my father. In fact, there are no my's, me's, or I's in the prayer at all. It's always our Father. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. We read this prayer, and our tendency is to personalize it, to individualize it. And that's the culture we live in. 
and we read our culture into this passage, we're more about the individual than the group, more about the individual than uh, the family, uh, more about the believer than the church. But this is a prayer prayed with others. This is a community prayer and not necessarily just an individual prayer. This God that we pray to is not only Father, but our Father in heaven. And as much as it sounds like it, it really doesn't have much to do with his location. Even though God is our Father, which speaks to his love and his care for us, in heaven speaks to his sovereignty. He's in control and has authority over all his creation. And that should give us hope, and that should give us a sense of security. So this introductory line to the prayer reminds us to whom we are praying. We see that he is both imminent and transcendent. He is close and yet beyond all things. It's because of this that we can trust that God is small enough to hear our prayers and yet is big enough to answer them. This brings us to the first three petitions. Notice that the prayer starts off with the focus on God. Hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done. As we are reminded of who God is in the introductory line, we're reminded in the rest of verses 9 and 10 that God comes first in all things, even in our prayers, especially in our prayers. According to the Heidelberg Catechism, hallowed be your name means to bless, to worship, and praise God for all his works and for all that shines forth from them, his almighty power, wisdom, kindness, justice, mercy, and truth. And it means help us to direct all our living, what we think, say, and do, so that his name will never be blasphemed because of us, but always honored and praised. It's to say that we want everyone to praise God, and that starts with us individually and with us as a church. Notice that this is a prayer of humility for us as well. In our natures, in our sinful natures, we want to make a name for ourselves. We want the praise. We want the glory. But this prayer starts off putting us in our place and God in his rightful place. He must increase and we must decrease. Keep in mind that this petition is not only about praising God with our lips. It's a petition that God might be honored and praised through our actions and our thoughts as well. Are we living in a way that brings honor to the great name of our God? The second petition is that God's kingdom would come. What do we mean by the kingdom? A simple way to think of the kingdom of God is the reign of Christ in the hearts and lives of believers. And how is the church related to the kingdom? One commentator put it this way. We can think of the church as a kind of outpost or embassy of the kingdom. An embassy is a national outpost situated in a foreign land. The embassy, while it wants to dwell peacefully in the foreign land, exists to advance the interests of another country. So likewise, the church, dwelling on earth in various nations around the world, exists to advance the interests of another kingdom, a heavenly kingdom. The church is the place where you expect to see the values and rules of the kingdom honored and upheld. The kingdom of God is what's called already and not yet. Christ reigns already and rules, but God's kingdom won't come in its final form until Christ returns. Until he does, the church works to advance the kingdom of God by loving others with the love of Christ and by proclaiming the gospel of Christ. The third petition is for God's will to be done. Just like it's not our name that's to be honored and praised, and how it's not our own personal or congregational kingdoms that we pray. It's also not our will that we ask to be accomplished. Our desire is for God's will to be done. We are to deny ourselves, we are to take up our crosses daily, and we are to follow him. We submit our desires to his, and we are to walk in his ways. So when we pray, first let's be reminded to whom we are praying. Then we pray in all humility for God to be glorified by his name being praised, that his kingdom would come and that his will would be done. 
And while of the seven petitions, the first three do begin with God, I think it's probably safe to say that so often in our praying that that order is reversed and we begin with our need. We're kind of like a, a farmer, Dr. George Sweeting related this story uh, in the May 22, 1992 edition of the Daily Bread Devotional uh, about a farmer who was single and he wanted a wife and so he put an ad in the newspaper that read, man, 35, uh, wants woman, about 25, with tractor. And then he put, please send picture of tractor. Um, <laughs> we're sometimes like that man. We say that we pray to God, but much of our prayer is self-focused. We want God to, to meet our need or answer our request, to solve our problem, to help our situation. In essence, to do something for us. The Bible indeed encourages us to pray and to pray specifically and fervently for our needs. Last week, we referenced this verse out of Hebrews. Therefore, let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace so that we may receive mercy and find grace and help in time of need. And while the Bible does instruct us, for example, to be anxious for nothing, but instead, by everything with prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. The focus is never really just on our need. It's always on the God who meets our need. Jesus taught his disciples and us to pray, give us this day, in verse 11, our daily bread. And that phrase can mean either give us bread today for the coming day or give us today the bread that we need for today because the word daily is only used here in the new testament and it's it's not an exactly clear word but it describes an, a, a particularly needed amount of food enough for the day or enough for the coming day but in essence this request is an affirmation of our total dependence on god to meet our needs it's a recognition that everything comes from his gracious and generous hand. In the classic Western movie, Shenandoah, Jimmy Stewart starts, uh, stars as Charlie Anderson, a Virginian farmer who's trying to keep his family out of the Civil War. And with an empty place set for his dead wife, his children are gathered around the supper table, and he begins this litany that they've obviously heard before. He says, now your mother wanted all of you to be raised as good Christians. And I might not be able to do that thorny job as well as she could. But I can do a little something about your manners. And so he gestures that they should all bow their heads. And he prays, Lord, we cleared this land. We plowed it, sowed it, and harvested it. We cooked the harvest. We wouldn't be here. We wouldn't be eaten if we hadn't done it all ourselves. We worked dog bone hard for every crumb and morsel. But we thank you just the same anyway. <laughs> for this food we're about to eat. Amen. Charlie Anderson is not alone in his failure to recognize God's provision. Even the ability to work comes from God. The Bible says in Deuteronomy 8.18... But you shall remember the Lord your God, for it is he who is giving you power to make wealth. King Solomon wrote in the book of Ecclesiastes, Furthermore, as for every man to whom God has given riches and wealth, he has also empowered him to eat from them and to receive his reward and rejoice in his labor. This is the gift of God. Give us this day our daily bread goes beyond bread. And it's an expression of our dependence upon God for all of our physical and material needs. I wonder, though, how in our affluent American culture, this petition is very real to us. Last year, Money, Inc. rated Howard County, Maryland as the seventh richest county of the United States. Now, I don't know about you, but at my house, I have a, a, a drawer in which we put bread. And frankly... I have enough bread for today and for tomorrow and probably for the day after that too. So is this petition only meaningful when we're out of bread? But even then, wouldn't we just pop by the store and buy another loaf or two? Why would we need to ask our Heavenly Father to supply the bread we needed for that day? 
Let me make a su couple of suggestions, a couple of thoughts. First of all, bread doesn't last forever. Have you ever taken out a couple slices of bread to make a sandwich and you notice that there's a little mold on them? What you do next is a reflection of your understanding of the phrase, best if used by. <laughs> bread becomes moldy. Investments fail. The stock market is unreliable. Retirement income can shrivel. Wealth can be erased, and financial security can disappear. Why? Because none, none of our material possessions are eternal. Many years ago, someone gave me a cassette tape. You young people may have to ask your parents what that is, but <laughs> it gave me a cassette tape uh, to listen to a talk given by a speaker at a conference of a particular organization that some people had even suggested was a faith-based business. Now, while I have no doubt that there were, are, there were and are Christians who are committed to and heavily involved in this multi-level marketing company, that doesn't necessarily make it a Christian company. Something to my knowledge, by the way, the company has never claimed I believe that I was given the message as a means of motivating me to become interested in and participating in this company, even though I had no interest, and as far as I know, I'd never expressed any interest. But it was something the speaker said for me personally that put the nail in the coffin. In his talk, which honestly had overtones of prosperity gospel theology, he said something like this. Someday, they're going to carry you to the cemetery in the back of a Cadillac. So you might as well buy one and enjoy it now. <laughs> that was the point that I hit the eject button and stopped listening to the tape because the speaker, who I believe was an upper-level member of this organization, had just revealed his cards and it was a game I wasn't interested in playing because it did not sync with or hold to biblical values. Just a few verses farther or further in Matthew 6, Jesus says, Do not store up for yourself treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is there will your heart be also. Bread doesn't last forever, and more importantly, our dependence should be on God because the request of daily bread expresses both a dependence on him and a confidence in him. You remember the story of the Israelites who just are barely out of Egypt, they're just a month out, and they get hungry and they complain to Moses that they don't have any food. And so God uh, supernaturally supplies for them uh, manna which uh, means, what is it? They weren't sure what it was. But um, the Bible says, I'm going to kind of jump in the middle of the context. It says, um, so it came about in the evening that the quails came up and covered the camp. And in the morning, there was a layer of dew around the camp. And when the layer of dew evaporated, behold, on the surface of the wilderness, there was a fine flake-like thing, fine as the frost on the ground. And when the sons of Israel saw it, they said to one another, what is it? For they did not know what it was. And Moses said to them, It is the bread which the Lord has given you to eat. Now the only condition for the Israelites were they were to gather up enough of this manna for their immediate needs. And if they gathered up too much and tried to store it, it would, it would go foul overnight. The exception was on the sixth day when they were allowed to gather twice as much because on the seventh day, the Lord's Sabbath, the manna did not appear, and what they had stored up would not go bad. By the way, the sons of Israel ate manna for 40 years until they came to the border of the land of Canaan. And I've, I've probably said this before, but when I think about this, I thought, how that every morning, every single morning, Israel witnessed God's daily provision of their need. And I wonder if you had asked a 20 or 30-year-old person, if they were sure that there would be manna on the ground tomorrow, if they would not have questioned your sanity for even asking the question, is there going to be manna tomorrow? 
Of course there's going to be manna. There's always been manna. Will there be manna? What kind of ridiculous question is that? Why did they know that there would be manna in the morning? They had seen God provide it faithfully every single day of their lives. And I wonder if their anticipation had even moved more towards expectation or even assurance. They knew God would provide. And while we should never, ever take God's provisions for granted, shouldn't we have, in a sense, the same assurance and confidence that our generous, giving Heavenly Father will give us our daily bread just like he gave the Israelites manna? The quest is about, folks, where you put your trust. Apostle Paul wrote, Instruct those who are rich in this present world not to be conceited or to fix their hope on the uncertainty of riches, now listen, but on God, who richly supplies us with all things to enjoy. We are to trust God as our provider. And then we move to the next request where we acknowledge him as our forgiver. And forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And I mentioned before that if, you know, if you've ever asked to recite the Lord's Prayer with others, and when it comes to this part of the prayer where we, we pray, forgive us, there's this little momentarily nanosecond hesitation because we need to understand, are, they, are we going to pray, forgive us our debts, or forgive us our trespasses? Or as one young child said, forgive us our trash baskets, as we forgive those who put trash in our baskets. Why are there different versions of the prayer? Well, the answer is simply tradition and, and translations. The important thing to understand, though, is what we're asking for, what we're praying for, is we're saying, forgive us our sins, which is exactly what Luke says. But notice that the request for our forgiveness is conditioned, not on our willingness to consider forgiving others who have sinned against us, but it's conditioned on us already having forgiven them. Now, I think what's view in here is our fellowship with God. This isn't about salvation from sin. What Jesus is teaching us about our fellowship being hindered because of our refusal to forgive others. This request is about honest relationships and one that forces us to root out any amount of hypocrisy, as Jim described, in our lives. It reflects the spirit of another prayer by the psalmist who wrote, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxious thoughts, and see if there be any hurtful way in me, and lead me in the everlasting way. Of all of the requests that Jesus could have included in teaching the disciples about prayer, he includes the need for forgiveness. To me, that is significant in and of itself because it makes a statement about the importance and the priority of right relationships. In just a few moments, we're going to celebrate the Lord's table together. And when we do that, we say that we're not only giving testimony to the fact that we have a relationship with Jesus Christ, but we're also making a statement, giving testimony about our relationship with one another. Jesus teaches us that we're to have honest relationships with one another. Because it's really important, not only as it relates to us uh, as individuals, but as it relates to the church, the body of Christ. One person commented, its object is to remind us that we must not expect our prayers for forgiveness to be heard if we pray with malice and spite towards other people. To pray in such a frame of mind is mere formality and hypocrisy. It is even worse than hypocrisy. It is as much as saying, do not forgive me at all. Our prayers are nothing without love. We must not expect to be forgiven if we cannot forgive. Charles Haddon Spurgeon, the great English preacher, said that if you pray the Lord's Prayer with an unforgiving spirit, you have virtually signed your own death warrant. By the way, the word forgiveness, both in the Old and New Testament, means to let it go. And as human beings, there may be nothing more difficult than letting it go, than forgiving those who've sinned against us, especially when those wounds and pain run deep. 
We may even feel justified in deciding that those who have sinned against us don't deserve to be forgiven, especially if they've never asked for forgiveness or never acknowledged any remorse or that they have indeed put trash in our trash baskets. But I want you to listen carefully. The reason that we are to forgive has nothing to do, uh, forgive another has nothing or has little to do about them. It's about us. Because the basis of our forgiveness rests on a simple yet profound truth. We forgive because we have been forgiven. The Bible says, be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving each other, just as God in Christ also has forgiven you. The fact that that we have been forgiven by Jesus, demands our forgiveness of others. And in the Lord's Prayer, God calls us to his standard of forgiveness. And to not hold to that standard is detrimental to our own spiritual health. Forgiveness may seem impossible, but through the grace and the power of God's indwelling Holy Spirit, who sheds abroad love in our heart, we can choose to forgive. We trust God as our provider. We trust him. We acknowledge him as our forgiver, forgiver, and we appeal to him as protector. Verse 13, and do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil. These last two requests are concerned about our spiritual need. Lead us not into temptation is not suggesting that God causes us to be tempted. While God may lead a person to a place of testing, he never tempts them. And the difference is that in testing, it is often meant for spiritual growth. Temptation is meant for spiritual harm. And so the Bible's absolutely clear. Let no one say when he is tempted, I'm being tempted by God, for God tempts no one with evil. Simple paraphrase might be, Father, I ask you not to bring us into temptation at any point in time. It, it's a request for protection from sin and an admission of our intrinsic helplessness. Every day we get up, we don't know what that day is going to bring. And while this request does not assume that we'll experience temptation, neither does it rule it out. Notice that the request is joined with deliver us from evil or as you probably have heard, it can be translated, deliver us from the evil one. This request recognizes that we live in an evil world under the authority of the evil one. Evil one. J.C. Ryle explains, we are taught to ask God to deliver us from, e from the evil that is in the world, the evil that is within our own hearts, and not least the evil one, the devil. We confess that so long as we are in this body, we are constantly seeing and hearing and feeling the presence of evil. It is about us, it is within us, and it is around us on every side. We entreat him who alone can preserve us to be continually delivering us from its power. By the way, how often should you pray to be delivered from evil and to not be led into temptation? Can I just point out? that this request is in the same prayer that says, give us this day our daily bread. We should pray for spiritual protection every day. Praying for spiritual, spiritual protection for ourselves, for our spouses, our children, our grandchildren, our family, our friends, our church, for one another, and for any others that God brings to mind. We pray because our Father, who is greater than the evil one, is able to deliver us. Jim read the doxology for yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And you may have heard that this doxology is absent from some of the early Greek manuscripts, so it's debated as to whether or not this was a part of the original prayer. And I would just say, though we can't be certain, I agree with the statement that the, the, the doxology is theologically profound and contextually suitable, which means it's fine right where it is. The real question is not that we pray, but do we really believe it? 
Pastor Jim made an interesting comment, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to conclude uh, with something he said. You cannot pray the Lord's Prayer and even once say, I. You cannot pray the Lord's Prayer and even once say, my. Nor can you pray the Lord's Prayer and not pray for another. And when you ask for daily bread, you must include your brother. For others are included in each and every plea. From the beginning to the end of it, it doesn't once say me. The Lord's Prayer begins with, and it ends with God. Let's pray. Lord, uh, thank you for giving us this way to pray and teach us to be faithful to this example and this pattern. And one of the things, Father, we see throughout this prayer, whether, Lord, we are asking for your name to be made holy, uh, for your kingdom to come, or for your will to be done, or whether we are asking you to meet our, our daily need, Lord, whether we're asking you to forgive us, or Lord, whether we're asking you for protection, our focus is always on you. You are the one who gives, and you are the one who provides, and you are the one who protects. And so, Lord, we are grateful for this prayer. And I ask, Lord, that you would deepen our understanding and experience in terms of being able to pray. Lord, we, we also ask just for grace to set aside uh, even if a, a couple moments a day, and to think through this prayer, to think through the truth of what you teach us. We thank you for the Lord Jesus who gives us the example. And so, Lord, as we continue to worship this morning, we thank you for your great love. In Jesus' name, amen. We are going to uh, continue to worship by taking the Lord's table together. And this morning there, there was out on the foyer a little basket that had a container of the juice and the wafer. If you did not get one, raise your hand. And uh, I think, Chris, we have uh, we'll get some help and we'll make sure everyone has one. And while we're making sure everyone has one, just let me say to you that taking the Lord's table is something of, it, it is our worship experience and grows out of our tradition that on the night in which he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus gathered with the disciples in the upper room took bread and he broke it. He said, this is my body. Eat, this is given uh, for your benefit, for your behalf. And then later he took one of the cups of that meal and said, this cup is the cup of the new covenant uh, of my blood, which is for the forgiveness of sin. And so he was taking these two tangible, tactile items and giving them great spiritual significance. Here we are, uh, believers in Jesus, 2,000 years later since then, and what we're getting ready to do is to join with believers who've gone before us uh, in uh, proclaiming the reality of the Lord's death. In fact, Paul told the church at Corinth, as often as you eat the bread and drink the cup, you are proclaiming the Lord's death, the reality of his death, that he, uh, until he comes again. So there's a sense where we're looking back at the death of Jesus. There's also a sense where we look now towards ourselves or to ourselves and to the Lord at the present, but there's also an element where we're looking towards the future. In our church, our tradition is that any believer is invited to join us for the Lord's table. You don't need to be a member of our church. This could be your very first Sunday here. If Jesus Christ is your personal Savior, we invite you to join us uh, and eat and drink together. Uh, if you're not, uh, if you're here this morning or you're watching and, and you, you have yet to come to that place of faith and trust in Jesus Christ, then what we're getting ready to do isn't going to have any real significance. And I, on the authority of God's word, I'd encourage you to withhold from participating rather than just go through the motions. The second statement, as I mentioned just a moment ago, is we're making a statement about us as the body of Christ. And we're making a specific statement about our unity as the body of Christ. So again, if for any reason you are not able to participate this morning, because of some unresolved relational issue with another believer, uh, and you can't make that right today, then uh, you may choose to refrain. What we're doing is both personal, but it's also, um, we're doing it as a community. So in our tradition, we're gonna have our, a couple of our men to come, a couple of our deacons, and they're going to offer Thanksgiving for the bread, and then we'll eat together, and then they'll offer Thanksgiving for the cup, and we will drink together. 
Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you uh, for this opportunity of communion. Father, as we take the bread, we think of um, your Son, Jesus Christ, sacrifice on the cross for our sins, and we are forgiven, and we are your children now. Father, may Holy Spirit, may your Spirit continue to help us to love our neighbors as you love us. Give our sacrificial love to others. Father, we really thank you in Jesus' name. Jesus said, as often as you eat this bread, do so in remembrance of me. Let us pray. Our Father, you have given us the grace of life through Jesus, giving of his life for us and to us. Mm -hmm. You have given us power over physical death through his resurrection. Father, this is beyond our understanding, yet we believe. Mm -hmm. We believe in the renewed and strengthened today as we drink of this, which represents the very life that Jesus gave for us. While sharing this life together, we drink the cup together with deepest gratitude and reverent praise. In his name we pray. Jesus said, as often as you drink this cup, do so in remembrance of me. Again, the Apostle Paul said, as often as you eat the bread and drink the cup, you are proclaiming the Lord's death until he comes again. Folks, that could be today. And I, that would be wonderful if Jesus came back today to gather his bride. And uh, if he did, it, it's great to know that we have remembered him through this act of worship by taking the Lord's table. We're going to end our gathering together this morning, and we're going to sing a final song. And if you're here today, or if you're watching online, and you have never made the commitment to trust Jesus as your Savior, and you would like to talk to someone about what that means, then if you're watching online, please contact us right now and let us know, and we'll respond as soon as we can. If you're here this morning and you'd like to talk to someone about, about the assurance of having a personal relationship with Christ, and uh, then as we're singing, I'm going to ask you to slip out of your seat, join me here at the front, and we'll find someone who can open God's Word to you and show you how you can know that for certain. Maybe there's another decision that you want to share publicly, and if that be the case, we encourage you to come. But let's stand together and sing, and you come as God leads. suggestion that throughout this week maybe you find a day where you can just take the Lord's Prayer and just pray that back to the Lord and thinking on some of the things that we have looked at today. Let's pray together. Lord, again, we thank you for your great love and we thank you for the provision in our lives. Lord, we thank you for the evidence of your love that is demonstrated not only throughout your word, but Lord, we have testimony and experience of our own lives of having experienced your love. I do think of the scripture, Lord, that God, that you demonstrate your love to us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And for that, we give you thanks. Lord, again, I'm thankful for every person who has been a part of our gathering together this morning. And Lord, as we get ready to leave and go back out into our uh, work, work and world this week, we pray that you would uh, give us opportunities to have gospel conversations with people and Lord, for those conversations that have taken place and where the seed has been planted, we pray the Holy Spirit will bring it to fruition. We are grateful, Lord. We love you. 
and we're thankful for your for being the great God that you are, and we give thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Thank you for being here this morning.